Brent, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? Melissa, I'm great. Thank you for having me on. I love this. I do too. And you're nearby. Not that it matters to anyone listening, but you're sitting <laughs> in from two hours away from yes. St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, we could meet in the middle for lunch if we wanted to. That's we could, but then I'd have to reconfigure everything I know about <laughs> energy because I'm not set up for in-person interviews. I can't do that. <laughs> hey, Brent, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, so I am from St. Louis, um, and we just shared a little bit about our podcasting stuff. So I have a podcast uh, that I host. It's called Nightmare Success In and Out. It's all about what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt, survive, overcome, set yourself free? Uh, I interview people that have gone to prison because I have gone to prison. And, um, you know, I think one of the things I was thinking when I was walking the, the path, uh, next to the barbed wire fence was, is, wow, this is bad. Like, where do I go from here? This is, this is rock bottom. What, do, what do I do now? And I started thinking about what do I do now? Because when you get out of prison, you are an ex-felon forever. It's, it's part of who you are and how you live with that could help people or you just go and hide and, you know, don't do anything with it. And, um, I decided to do something with it. I became an author, um, and I wrote a book about the journey that I was on, which I, I've, I've lived quite a journey being 56 years old of what, you know, some would say it's kind of like fiction. Um, I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't probably gone through it all. Uh, so yeah, so I've got a book that's nightmare success, um, loyalty, betrayal, life behind bars, adapting finally breaking free. And that kind of spawned the idea of, well, I was walking the dogs with my wife. I said, you know, I think I'm going to do a podcast. And she said, well, really, Brent, what are you going to do as a podcast? I said, well, I've got like 50 people on my Facebook that I was at Leavenworth with. I think I'll talk to them about their, you know, their early life, life before prison, life in prison, life out of prison. How, what were the strategies they used to get through that? Like dark times, you know, you either survive or you become a victim and, and how do you do it? How do you get through it? And so we started doing it and, you know, I really found Melissa that it really became after the first interview, I was hooked. It was like, it became a passion of mine. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love this platform. I love the idea that people can listen to this. They can maybe identify I've been in a dark place and while they're identifying, they're like, oh my gosh, that person's maybe not as like prison creatures, I thought, and maybe that would be like, they could give them a second chance when they run across them. So there was a lot of different layers going along, but overall, I just love the idea of having a place where people can go. I believe hope doesn't go out of style. So these stories, uh, hopefully inspire people to believe that they can also make it. And Brent, I love your story. I think it's a made for TV movie, just waiting to happen. And I do have one request when it does yes. happen, obviously this interview will be featured in it. Uh, would you have Jennifer Garner play me, please? Of course. I mean, without a doubt. And this, and, and this interview would actually lead with the beginning intro. So the, we'd have to have the right person going with that. I'm glad we're on the same page. It makes the process so much more easy to do. So Brent, you don't look like a guy that would have been in prison. And that is such a stupid thing for me to say. And I don't use that S word very often because what is, what does that even mean? You don't look like a person who has been in prison. I think we have stereotypes. I know we have stereotypes. We do. Yeah. Prison. I have an image that goes along with that. You don't sure. have an image. I, and and uh, you believe it or not, Melissa, that was actually told to me by my bunkmate as I was in the first minutes of being in prison. Uh, my bunkmate came up to me, Romo, kind of like a five foot eight stocky boxer guy, Hispanic, who was also a shot caller on the yard. And uh, he said, Cast, you don't look like you've ever been here before. You're going to need a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am going to need a lot of help. And he gave me a lot of help. And that's, 
you know, one of the things that really surprised me about prison, um, most of us, you know, see things on TV and, and wherever we see these things, um, it's all mostly bad. It, when I was standing at the gates of Leavenworth, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, am I going to survive? You know, I was thinking everything behind me is what I love and what I know. Everything in front of me is the unknown and the unknown would seem really scary because the next step I was taking was beyond the gate and into this 1879 looking Shawshank building. And, uh, I thought, I, I thought I could die. I thought I could get raped. I thought only bad things could happen. And within, you know, once I went through the prisonization thing of going in those four or five hours to get into prison, um, once they got me to where I was going to go, it was absolutely amazing how many people helped me. And I was like, I just like took a deep breath, like, oh gosh, I, I do. I, wow. And, you know, within an hour, I was able to make a phone call, um, through my counselor's office to tell my family on the other line, I'm going to be all right. Mm. I really felt that way because, you know, the night before, um, I remember I was, it was like, it only gives me chills to think about going back to that. But when, when I, the night before I, I was supposed to, to, uh, voluntarily surrender, my wife and I had driven up and the sun was kind of going down and there were people walking around the fence and, and then you could kind of see the lights coming on in the cell block. So I could kind of see in those bunk beds and plastic chairs. And the thought that went through my mind, Melissa was that I'm going to actually be in there tomorrow night. And it wasn't like I was going to be there for like a day. I was sentenced to five years. So it was, that's going to be my life for a while, for a good while. It was just such a deep thought because, and I didn't say anything to Julie because it probably would have really freaked her out. But my thought was, is I really got to come to grips with this is something that I have to get. Even though it's the unknown, I'm going to have to have some strategies to work through this. And, and my biggest fear was that I would lose myself, that I would become prison Brett instead of Brett. So my strategies in prison were mostly to try to keep being me, you know, and, and I share those, um, to people when I talk about how do you keep being you, how do you keep stepping forward? And I think you have to almost have things that are mind hacks that keep you from falling into that institutional mindset. And, and that, I, when I say institutionalized, I don't mean that it's just prison. People on the outside clearly get institutionalized. Mm -hmm. They're, it goes back, Melissa, to what we were talking. That when you get into that ugly routine that's comfortable for you, um, you'll, leave, you'll stay in that only because it's comfortable Mm -hmm. even though you don't like it. And that's what happens in prison. People get into these ugly routines so much so that they get close to getting freedom and they'll put hands on a guard or some sabotage themselves and stay in prison because freedom has now become fearful, uh, scary and unfamiliar. And that's kind of what we do on the outside is, you know, you get that opportunity to maybe grow in your job or a new opportunity and you just don't do it because it scares you. And part of my, you know, people say, well, nightmare success, what's where, you know, those two words don't go together. Right. I'm like, aha, they, but they do go together because they're always together. Because if you really want to get your own success, you actually have to step into the thing that scares you, the thing that kind of makes you nervous. Uh, maybe it's a nightmare, but you got to go over under it around it to set yourself free to whatever you're wanting to be. And, um, uh, so few people do that, which is, um, I think there's so many, I was reading this thing, Melissa, about new year's resolution. So there's like roughly like 330 million people in the United States, roughly around 200 million people, which is like 65% say they want to do something different to, you know, step out of their pepper zone, make themselves proud, whatever that is, you know, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to go get it you know, a better job or what, you know, whatever. I'm going to spend more time, all those different things. But we lose 25% of those people the very first week, after the very first week. And then we lose 46% of those people after the month. 
And then you've got this eight percenter club that makes it to the end of the year. So how in the world could you start so good and then end up with an eight percenter club? And it's really back to that whole thing. And it's a worn out thing, but it is mindset, you know, that you just say, you get to that point, Melissa, and you say, ah, I'm good. I'm sore. I don't want to really like that workout routine. I didn't really, no, I don't really like waking up earlier to do that. You know, you just, you just kind of just say, I'm good. There's a, there's a really good saying. I'm a big Shawshank Redemption fan. It's one of my favorite movies, not because I went to prison. I just think it has a lot of life stories in it. And it's really weird to watch it when you're in prison, which I have, but very odd. But one of the things that, that Morgan Freeman says in there to Andy Dufresne when he's, they're looking at the wall and he says, you know, when you first get here, these walls you perceive are to keep you in. And he says, the longer you're here, these walls put their arms around you, give you comfort. And that's kind of where we get, Melissa, is in that weird mindset that these walls become your comfort zone, even though you want to be over across the other way. You know, it is a grim perspective, but once you realize that you are, that life is a series of choosing discomforts, mm -hmm. then you can have that moment of epiphany and choose differently. For instance, if you are um, battling with money issues, say, it's uncomfortable to be in debt. It's also uncomfortable to climb out of debt and to save money and to budget, but you are choosing your discomfort. Yeah. A and great you, analogy. Yeah. Yeah. You can apply that to anything. And I think yeah. once you realize that you are always choosing a discomfort, again, mm -hmm. that's from perspective, but it leads to better choices, to more yeah. informed and intentional choices and actions. Yeah. And you know, the, it's, I was just interviewing a guy last week and I thought it was he, he, his story was just exactly what he said most that he had a choice to make and he was in prison. It wasn't a good, it wasn't his fault really. It's, you know, his mom was into drugs and she left a family. The dad who stayed with him dies in a motorcycle accident. He's 14 years old. He, he ends up homeless, ends up doing whatever he can do to survive, gets into drugs and he gets, you know, two or three years in prison. But because the two parents were the black sheeps of the family, he didn't have any connection. Well, when he's in prison, one of the aunts from Ohio, he's in Florida, starts reaching out to him. And he has, and, they, and she says, you can come live with me, but we're going to, but we're going to get a clean plate, you know, going forward. And he had to make a decision. I don't know these people. I don't know Ohio. And he decided that's the only way my life is going to work is if I choose this path. And what he did with that path was, is he, he went to community college, he got some confidence. Then he went to Ohio State and he got even more confidence. He, and he um, graduated top of his class. And then he couldn't get a job because of his past record. And so he didn't let that stop him. He thought, you know what, that's a problem. You know, there's, there's 25 million ex-felons. Uh, I'm not the only one going through this. So he, he goes out to investors, creates a business plan, and he creates a company called Honest Jobs that he founds. Now he's the CEO of, it's the largest of its kind in the nation. And he deals with 1300 uh, companies placing over, you know, gosh knows how many people. And none of that was easy. Absolutely. Ab none of what I just said from, from the time he was 14 to homeless to prison, to going into a family that he didn't know, to getting good grades, not getting a job and starting a company, all those things were really tough. But he did it. Now I interviewed him and it's like a, a total inspirational story because he didn't stop. And I think so many people get so close and they stop and they never realized that they were just right there, but they didn't give themselves the chance to go ahead and be at the top of it. That, how do you fix that? I don't know. Yeah. Brent, I would like to shift gears for a moment and but. Would you mind sharing with us the backstory? Because you have sure. before prison. And yeah. what, what's the story there? Well, you know, I thought that I was living like a really normal life as a kid. And I was. I mean, the only thing that was different was my dad went to prison. 
And so dropping that bomb in there is kind of odd because it, my, my neighborhood, my friends, you know, we grew up Norman Rockwell, you know, but I had this dad, um, everybody's got their parents, you know, how they perceive them. But my dad was like bigger than life. You know, he was, came from a small town, from a farm. He, he won the state championship in basketball. He was a Victorian. He went to D1, played basketball, got out of there. He went to law school, graduated number one in his class. Sprinted out of there, won some big cases, was on TV, was just kind of a known guy. And then he got into business and he was the guy with the golden touch. And it was like, like 14 years old at that time thinking, man, I want to be just like him. I mean, what, what, sign me up. And he's my dad. And then one night, as I'm thinking all this, he calls my brother and I into after dinner and he says, I got something I need to share with you boys. And he said, uh, boys, I've gotten into a heap of trouble with the bank I own. And, um, you know, I told him they run the government. I run the bank and it's gone from bad to worse since then. And they've offered me a plea deal and he's talking and I'm not hearing, I'm thinking, wait, how, how does this even make any sense? The guy that's the, you know, everything, the golden touch. And by the time it's all coming back and he's telling me that he's going to take this federal deal and he's going to go to prison and we're going to move. I'm taking moves oh. and we're going to move to St. Louis, which is like, you know, the metropolis of nowhere. And, um, I couldn't have, I, I was thinking this is the worst family meeting that you could ever have. And we moved and, um, strange to move when your dad goes to prison because you move into a new neighborhood and okay, she's not widowed. She's married. She's not divorced. Where is he? And so we, there was no Google at that time. So thank God. So we just said he's out of town working. And it was true. He's two and a half hours down the road at Marion prison and he had a kitchen job. So we were good with that, but it was a gigantic elephant in the room. I mean, moving in, you know, I was 15 years old at this time, getting ready to start a new school and nobody knew that my dad was in prison. And I remember was a couple of things when, um, we went to visit my dad in prison. It was one of them was it's like, we were like a pretty wealthy family and then we weren't. And it was like, we're that family. Now we, we go to prison on the weekends to visit my dad. And it was just kind of a thing you kind of layer in on yourself. Okay. We're that now we're, we're going to go do this. You worry a little bit about, you know, when that person comes around the corner, it's your dad, you know, he's going to look, he's going to be in a prison uniform. Is he okay? Has he turned into some kind of prison creature? And he was, he looked good and he seemed like he was well just, so that made me feel more comfortable. But I remember when we left, it was like such a deep thought to me was this will never happen to me. No matter what happens in my life, I'll never find myself here. And what's crazy about it is jumping forward back. My dad got a 10 year sentence and I got a five year sentence. So when I got out of prison, I went back to that prison that I visited him at when I was 15 years old. And that's kind of like the mind buzz of all mind buzzes that I said, I'd never be in prison. I go back to the prison that dad was in and he's still at that prison. So that was really weird, but dad gets out of prison and. I was kind of proud of him all over again because there was one company that survived, not a sexy company, Melissa. It was a funeral company and it prearranged funeral services before you died. So you would freeze the price. You pick out your caskets and your services and your pallbearers and your music. And it really did take a burden off the family. So it was a company that grew. The reason we didn't lose that company is dad had set that company up in a family trust. So it was my mom and my brother and me and dad set it up as an attorney and there it was. So that company continued to grow. And when I got older, I was going to be a political, well, I was, I was a political science major, theater minor, but I was doing it because I wanted to be a trial attorney. You know, those cool guys on TV that go up and do their thing. I wanted that. And I made pretty good grades in college. I, I graduated in 3.4. I mean, I wasn't a 4.0 student, but not bad. 
But Melissa, when you give me a standardized test, I mean, I, I used to blame it on the fact I'm left-handed, but I would just register on the dumb, 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 dumb scale. And I had to get this, I had to get past this LSAT to, to and it was a standardized test. I just, I mean, I took the prep classes there. I just had a terrible time with it. So I really had to come to a fork in the road in my life at that point was this is what I planned on doing. And I'd always done sales over the course of, you know, college. And I kind of liked it because it felt like a good rhythm, you know, like I played sports. So it was like you had a scoreboard, you won, you lost, you negotiated, you, you got the deal, you didn't get the deal. It didn't matter how old you were. You could always play if you were good. So I liked that. And so I thought maybe I'll go talk to my dad about, and I really thought about it. It's like, what if I try this out with our company? I went and talked to dad. Dad was always our biggest cheerleader. And I said, dad, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm obviously this law school thing is going to have to take a back burner. You know, maybe I'll come back to it, but it fails. Oh, he's, oh, Brett, you'd be great. You got all the, the yeah. It, I said, but dad, dad, I, 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 you just cast such a big shadow. Is there anywhere I can go that I could just be me pass fail? And he said, well, yeah, he said, Texas is a new state. We just find a funeral home down in Austin. Arvin Harold Funeral Home. I said, I'll take it. I'll absolutely. So I, Austin, Texas, 23 years old, went down there, Melissa, and loved it. It was in my wheelhouse. It, 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 it really gave me confidence. Again, I started building a, a, a group, a sales group. We won after a course of a year, I'd promoted myself to regional vice president. Our team had won every division in the contest. And my dad was so eager and it was, he was proud, but he was so eager to hand me the keys to the car and say, you can do the sales company, Brent. And I was just 20 something kid that wanted that. And we had an insurance company at that time. And I had absolutely no, no interest in insurance at all, but I owned it. And, um, which is part of my bad story is don't ever do that. Don't ever own something and just assume that it'll just be taken care of you have to be responsible for what you have responsibility for. But arrogantly at that time, I thought I, I can go out and create this and it's dumped over here and everything's good. And we continue to grow. Well, we did grow. We grew from three states to 25 states. And my brother came into the business and we kind of created a sexy company by accident. But my brother was always kind of technology world. One of the funny things he used to do was he took, take one of those recorders when you were little and he hit the play button and he would secretly record like you're, you and me, Melissa talking yeah. and then he'd play it back to him. He thought it was funny. Well, he'd run across the cassette tape and he had taped my grandmother and my mom at the kitchen table, just, you know, gossiping, whatever. And he found that and it came downstairs and we listened to it as a family. And my grandmother had died three years prior to that. And we sat around thinking, wow, isn't that something that She's only been gone for three years, but you start to lose the inflection in her voice, the way she laughed and talked. And we started talking, isn't that weird that everybody who's famous has that? I mean, can you imagine like Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth dies and there's no highlight film. There's no, nothing of her life. We said, well, where is it? Did I miss it? But if you, your grandparents, your parents, your uncles and aunts, we don't have that. So we said, why don't we become the filmmakers for everyone else? And there's an old African proverb that says, when someone dies, a library burns. And so we wanted to become the library of lives for the community. But how do we do that? So we started buying cemeteries and people who own cemetery property, we went to them and we just basically take out their scrapbook and we put a camera and we start talking to them about their life. And it was fantastic. And we would take those and we'd play them at funerals and then we'd have their own highlight film. And then once the internet came, we had our own uh, forever network. But it was interesting, Melissa, because there had never been anything done in the last 125 years in that world. And so we, we just got a lot of publicity, you know, front page of the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fortune, Time Magazine, um, HBO did a documentary on us uh, called The Young and the Dead. And then that spawned the, the HBO series Six Feet Under. So, you know, life couldn't have been any better. I was like 40 some odd years old, you know vacation home, country club, friends, kids at private schools. And I thought, man, I'm accomplished. 
And then I'm filling up the gas tank one day at the gas station and a phone ring. And it's the president of our insurance company. He says, Brent, I just got off the phone. It's the weirdest phone call from this lady from the state of Ohio, from the investigative division. I'm thinking none of this sounds good. And she says that she's got information that could bring our company down. It was, it was like, it was just like a cold chill went up my spine. You know, I got a cold sweat and I'd felt this before because of that. My dad telling me that night when I was 14 years old, but this felt a lot different because now I'm in this with him and I'm not really sure what she's talking about or what Randy's talking about. Well, later what had happened was, is that we, as a company, the insurance company that I acted like wasn't mine, we would reinsure our business out. I'm not going to get in the weeds about that. It's only that you write business, you sell it to this bigger company and they pay you a commission for it. Pretty simple. We happen to have the largest reinsurance company in the world. They were headquartered out of Germany and we had done a reinsurance agreement, which was really good for us. And they had kind of gotten backwards in the market and they came to us and said, Hey, would you guys like to renegotiate this? Well, my dad being the guy he was, being the legal mind was, uh, wait a minute, this isn't our contract. So no, you guys should go pound can. Not the right answer, by the way, because it would have been a lot easier for us to renegotiate that contract. Probably wouldn't even be telling you the story right now, Melissa, if we would have done that. But we didn't. And so what happened was, is it goes into the arbitration. Arbitration is a panel that figures out, is there a solution to this? And Grant, these guys are the biggest there is. So discovery be starts becoming extremely expensive. It hits the $2 million, $4 million, $8 million, $10 million. And so what that starts doing is it starts hitting our capital and surplus in the insurance company. Things start to leak out. We're in 25 states. Regulator regulatory people do not like any type of smoke. And so we get, a, we start getting a lot of questions. And my dad comes to me and he said, Brent, we're, we're in some issues here. And I can't go talk to him and I'm an ex felon, but I, we need somebody to go speak. And I'd really think you'd be a good voice. And the first thing I was thinking was, this, damn, this is the one should have been paying attention to, and now I got to go out and defend this. And I wanted to, you know, I was so cocky at that point in my life. You know, we had four or 500 people that were working for us and I wanted to put the cape on. I want to make dad show him I could do it, everybody. And I thought I could. And there were days that I thought I could because we came pretty close, but ultimately we didn't. Um, the company ended up going into receivership. Uh, then from receivership, we got to a federal investigation. And the only thing I say about a federal investigation is it's like being thrown into like a dark hole and you think you've got the sides you can grab onto. And each time you try to grab the side, they just keep spreading out and you keep dropping and it's dark and you go to bed fighting it. You wake up fighting it. And I finally got to a point where we went through six years of just, and it was a big story and, and, uh, my daughters were teenagers and the one thing that they had me on that I couldn't get away from Melissa, cause there's so many laws out there. It's like, you just pile them on. But I had a real one where the company was founded, I think in 79, but they passed a law in 1994 that an ex felon couldn't work in the business of insurance. Hmm. And I owned the company and I was allowing my dad to work in the business of insurance. And I wasn't aware that that was, but I was in a position because of my position to have the responsibility to know that. And that carried a five-year sentence. So everything else kind of ran into the conspiracy of, you know, wire fraud, mail fraud, anything you bought was money laundering. So what they do in the federal situation is that they stack all those and they carry like 10 to 20 years. And I remember as we were getting close to the end of this, as I was, I was having a drink one night and I just thought, I'm going to add this up because they just stack all these. I was looking at 928 years. It just like took my breath away. Like, this is so bad. And my kids said, dad, you can't go to trial. And I, and I knew that. I mean, I mean, 
they told me that. And I, you know, I'm always surrounded by my girls and my wife and they say, you can't go to trial. We lose you forever. Yeah. And I was, Melissa, worn out anyway. And so right. it was, but I, the, the, the switch, the switch gear didn't really hit me until once we decided that that's what I was going to do and I was going to plea. We had a family meeting that night and my kids and my wife, it was like around the 4th of July and they were at our vacation home. And so it was my mom, my dad, my brother and me, we were on this call. Dad and I were going to go down and plead guilty the next morning. And so we got off this call. It was kind of just a call, you know, we'll get, help take care of the girls, you know, they've got, they're getting the college and all, all this kind of stuff. But it was, it was the first time I, when I got off the phone, I thought, wow, I'm actually going to be a felon. I'm going to be an ex-felon for the rest of my life. Do I even want to be that? I mean, I haven't even contemplated that. Well, how do I live as that? And being by myself that night, which was smart to be contemplating that and thinking that and going down the spiral of, of really just feeling sorry for myself, had a drink. I started thinking, you know, to all these people around me, you know, am I just a, a weight around their neck? You know, this Julie, she's been such a warrior through this and such a great wife and held everything together. Doesn't she just need a clean start? And the girls, you know, can they live with the stain of a dad being an ex-felon? I had another drink and I, I literally, I mean, I think about it today and I can't believe that I'm telling this story about myself, but I get a piece of paper out and I start writing, you know, how great a wife Julie's been. And we've known each other since she was 13. I was 15. We've gone through all our stages together. She needed to clean start. The girls, all the fatherly advice, she, all my friends that had stuck by me, grabbed another drink and grabbed the keys, went down to the car and turned it on. I didn't know if I was going to go run into a tree or just let the car run. And Melissa, it was like something I remember it so vividly as, as I'm telling this right now, it's like it happened right now. It, it's like a bolt went through me. It's like, oh my God, Brent, what are you doing? Well, what in world are you doing? You're the glass half full guy. You're the guy that's looking for the solutions. What a horrible legacy to your family and friends and to have quit and what do you, what in the world are you thinking? And it was the first time that it really hit me, Melissa, that there's such a difference between a survivor and a victim. Yeah. Because the survivor, well, a victim takes all your strength away. You have to find something to blame and, and you, you feel small and almost like you curl up in a fetal position. But if you even say the word survivor, you, you feel different. You stand up a little bit different. And it was that moment. And my, I mean, total rock bottom moment, Melissa, that I thought this, no matter what happens from here on out, and it was so ugly what was coming at me. I was going to go plead guilty tomorrow in a federal courthouse. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know how long I was going to go, but I thought, regardless of that, I am going to be somebody that my family can say that they're proud of how I'm handling the situation to survive it. And it, that, that helped me so much, Melissa, from that point, because I had so many bad things that were coming, but I handled everything in a different mindset of not feeling sorry for myself, not blaming. I, I really strapped on the whole thing that you're going to, what are you going to, you're going to venture this out, Brad, you're going to walk through it. And I felt different. And everything that happened from that point forward was really scary. I, I, I never want to like play it down that. This stuff isn't scary. It's really scary to go through losing a lot of things and going to prison and not knowing. But I will say this for anybody who's listening out there, nothing is ever as bad as your mind makes it out to be, not even prison. And so you can get through it. It's just, you have to be willing to accept that it's going to be scary, but somehow, some way you're going to be able to adapt to it. And so when I went through and I went to prison, I had already dealt with that moment. So I think it helps me to stand at those gates. And then when I got to my bunk bed and my plastic chair in my locker, I, I had dealt with it in that this is okay because I'm going to do whatever I have to do. Maybe if I hadn't have gone through that, Melissa, maybe it would have been different for me, but 
Well, I thank God I got a hold of myself that night because it, when I tell that story to you or other people, I, I really feel like I'm telling it about somebody else. I feel like I'm outside my body talking about it because I am not that guy. But I kept that letter with me a long time after the fact because I wanted to remember, don't you ever let yourself get that low because that's, that's a terrible alternative. What do they call that a, a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem? There's so many things that you need to be thinking about, but that, that you get into the illogical, but anyway, I got past that, Melissa, and it was, it was, uh, I don't know that you'd say it was smooth sailing, but, um, I had a different mindset. Brent, I have so many reactions to your story. And I also want to say, if you want to do theological, we can do theological. Mm -hmm. Also, I think something that came so clear to me as you were talking about victimhood versus being a survivor was an embodiment. And you just alluded to it there as well. An embodiment of hope yeah. and purpose and action. As long as it's not embodied in you, as long as it's outside of you happening to you, you're going to remain a victim. But yeah. once you embody that for yourself, that you can act, you can choose you have the power to decide for yourself who you are. No matter what the circumstances say, you get to decide what you think, how you feel about yourself. And even though your choices are limited, you still get to be the boss of your mind, body, and soul. That's Which is huge. Yeah. Which is huge because once you come to that realization, uh, the possibilities are endless. You know, mm -hmm. that then, then you, uh, you know that you could walk into a situation that might scare you, but you also know that you're going to be the one that can adapt to it yeah. and tough it out. You know, a lot of it, a lot of it's kind of just grit, you know, the, the, even the, even the example you gave Melissa of coming out of that, that's grit. You know, so many people say, well, I just can't do it. Well, why not? I mean, you don't want to do it is what you're saying because you can do it it's just not going to be fun it's not easy but you you can do it you've chosen the debt instead of the discomfort of grit right right yeah yeah brent i want to have you back <laughs> follow up on this. Uh, my mind is just reeling. Your story is so incredible and ripe with so many good lessons and nuances to build a life on. And I just want to say, I'm so proud of you for making the choices you did, that it would have been very easy for you to have um, wallowed in the loss of your success. And I'm so proud that you didn't, that you had whatever rock bottom moment you needed in order to make the choices that you did. And that's such an inspiration. I really and appreciate that, Melissa. I really do. And, and I think the other thing that's uh, something that I really found out, well, like a couple of different things I found out going through all this. One is just clearly don't ever judge a book by its cover because some of the coolest people that I've met look a lot different than I do. And uh, they had a lot of different experiences in their life than I did, but I they found out they were really good people. Um, the other thing that I, I, I think that, you know, as you go through this is that everybody's situation is, is relative to what they're dealing with. So I do believe everybody has prisons built up in their own mind. You know, mm -hmm. how you knock through those, um, I feel like there's the best way to do that is look for people that are getting it right. You know, like when I went to prison, I didn't want to say a whole lot. I was just looking around like, oh, he's got a good prison job or that guy's reading books that I like, or he's got a good prison workout routine. I want to get in shape like that. We should do that when we're out and about here, you know, because what it does is it gives you more confidence. If somebody's already getting it right, it's like getting the answers to the test before the test. You, you, sure. most people, if you just humble yourself, 
will tell you how they're getting it right because they like the fact that they are getting it right. So if somebody recognizes it, they like to talk about it. Um, and I found that that was one of the, the big things that helped me in prison and really actually starting a company too, if I really think about it, you know, finding people that were doing things and then implementing that. Uh, if people would just humble themselves enough to look around and see people, uh, hear people, uh, I think it, they can get so much that they need to put in their own life instead of trying to think, well, I could just never do that or I never know how to do that. There's probably all the answers out there if you just kind of look for it. And, you know, I also want to encourage people, religious, not religious, you don't have to be religious to have spiritual um, practices. And it is so important to do that because as we have seen in your story, Brent, you had it all and yet you're not immune to the abyss. Right. And whatever we do, whoever we are, it's so vital to our health physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually to connect with something transcendent. However you want to name that, however you want to define that engage in those practices because that will give you the strength and the foundation to embody your hope and your choices and your actions. So true. I and mean, I think the other thing that's so, what I think I see that I hope becomes less, and I don't know if it's because of social media that everybody's living their best life, everybody's going on their best vacation, everybody's going to the best dinner, party, whatever that is. And they, all these kids and everybody see this, so they don't think they can make a mistake. And, you know, all the great kings of the world of business or life have made mistakes. And so they, you know, the mistakes don't define them. They make them wiser and they evolve and become better from their mistake. The only way that it doesn't work on mistakes is if you, if you make the same mistake twice. That's where things get really muddy. I mean, Jack Nicholas says, you know, you can have, make a bad shot on a golf ball, just but don't make two bad shots because it messes up the hole. But as long as you know that when you make mistakes, because I really think that if how you handle a mistake makes you a winner or a loser or gets, makes you stuck or unstuck. Absolutely. And it's, it's just important to think that it's okay if we could all just give each other a break and go do what you do and not be afraid of whatever that passion is, just flow with it. And you're going to find yourself making mistakes. Just go with it. And you'll, you'll find that whatever that is, that makes you, I call it the Zaywan Taneo, you know, the, the, the Andy Dufresne thing that he does when he's chipping through the wall for 19 years, you know, it's, what it, it, it's the whitest of the white sands, the bluest of blue waters, the old fishing boat that he's going to fix up when they're going to sit at that porch on the end and watch the sun go down. That keeps him chipping every night. And then every day he gives himself a daily victory of the holes in his pocket, letting that wall out into the prison yard. We need that. And that's the thing I, to me, Melissa, I think that's the secret ingredient that if you have that, it gives you the fuel that they want to nail in your soul and your, what you feel, why you do it. That'll be the thing that keeps you stepping. That puts you in the eight percenter club at the end of the year because you know why you're doing it. You can feel it. You, I don't want to get up this morning, but yeah, I do because I really, really want that really bad. That's, that's, I think the secret, you know, if everybody says, Hey, what's the secret to all that? I kind of think that's a lot of it. If you want different, you have to do different. Right. Exactly. Brent, the link to your book is in the show notes. I hope everyone Great. click on that link. It'll take you to the website. There's all kinds of information there about Brent and you can get his book. What else would you like us to know, Brent? Oh man, I think I, I think I talked all the way through this thing. I didn't know if I let you talk, Melissa, but I, I really enjoy uh, your show and I appreciate you having me a guest on your show. Um, you're doing good stuff and you know, that's what it's about getting out here and, and seeing if you can, can help somebody make a change. And when they do, that's always a great thing. And if you're a part of that, that's the fuel that puts you back out there again. All right, Brent, thank you so much. And I can't wait to interview you again. 
So bye for now. I look forward to it. Thanks, Melissa.